Blists Hill Victorian town in Shropshire revives the sights, sounds and smells of the 19th century. Good morning. At its heart stands the pharmacy, a treasure house of potions and remedies from a century and a half ago. Now, in a unique experiment, Ruth Goodman, Nick Barber and Tom Quick are opening the doors to the Victorian pharmacy, recreating a high street institution we take for granted, but which was once a novel idea. How can I help? They'll bring the pharmacy to life, sourcing ingredients, mixing potions and dispensing cures. But in an age when skin creams contained arsenic and cold cures were made from opium, the team will need to be highly selective. They'll only make safe versions of traditional remedies and try them out on carefully selected customers. The start was like the Wild West. People didn't know what was good and bad. Try and get a bit of speed up. Oh, there we go, yeah. The pharmacy was something that affected everybody's lives in one way or another. They'll discover an age of social transformation that brought healthcare within the reach of ordinary people for the very first time, heralding a consumer revolution that reached far beyond medicine to create the model for the modern high street chemist as we know it today. The Victorian pharmacy opens its doors in 1837, the year when the teenage Queen Victoria ascended the throne. Wow, look at this place. <laughs> this is fantastic. Ooh, that smell. It's much bigger than I thought it would be. There's a heck of a lot of stuff here, isn't there? There's a tremendous amount of stuff. Fresh from her time on the Victorian farm, Ruth Goodman will now be applying her skills in new areas from medicines to cosmetics. As a domestic historian, she knows just how important the pharmacy was to ordinary people. Doctors were expensive. Really, on a day-to-day -day basis, only the rich were using doctors. Occasionally, a poor person might be able to save up for a, a consultation. Maybe a doctor might offer some free consultation. But in general, most people in the 19th century turned to the pharmacist for the majority of their health care. It's a beautiful place to, to be in. We're going to be able to make this work really well. <laughs> Nick Barber is Professor of the Practice of Pharmacy at the University of London School of Pharmacy. Parrot brand, polishing soap and monkey brand. But things like Sloan's liniment, which people use nowadays, and Zambuck. As the pharmacist, he will be responsible for recommending and preparing all the remedies and medicines that his shop dispenses. It's a unique opportunity for Nick to learn how his profession evolved. It's a fantastic chance to recreate what it was like to be a Victorian pharmacist at a time when pharmacy was completely different to how it is today. Pharmacists were creating new things, lots of innovation happening then, the growth of chemistry through this period, and pharmacists were experimenting and developing new sorts of treatments as well. We're going to have fun with this. I'm going to go and see how this sign's getting on. OK, see you, right. see you, see you in a minute. There's old pill-rolling devices here. Look at these liquids up here. This is a tincture of zingib. No Victorian pharmacy would be complete without an apprentice. And these are all the Latin names that I'm going to have to know about. And that job falls to Tom Quick, a PhD student in the history of medicine. He's hoping to put theory into practice. All the drugs were, were the natural products were all in their Latin names as well. Oh, well, and so much equipment as well, right? It's remarkable, isn't it? Really, what I think of as history isn't about just seeing things behind glass cases. It's about people's lives and what people did on a day-to-day -day basis. We've got all the kit here, which is was all needed in those days. They've got... Um, got the balance there, right? It's yeah, you'd be weighing things out carefully. Thing. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, careful being the key word, because you killed people if you got the, these things wrong. <laughs> I mean, I'm just old enough that some of these things I was taught when I was an undergraduate, but I've never used them professionally. So actually, to do these sorts of things, to go back to mixing, to pounding, to compounding mm. things, is, is an enormous challenge. <laughs> The front of shop is where they will come face to face with the public. In the early Victorian age, new ideas on how to treat illness were beginning to filter through to the high street. 
But in this moment of change from traditional to scientific medicine, many of the cures the pharmacy will sell are based on old beliefs and remedies. Poison of lance-headed viper. Oh, my goodness. In 1837, despite the dangerous product on the shelves, anyone could trade as a pharmacist. Even grocers were setting up as chemists. <laughs> Look at that! Yeah, wow! That looks <sighs> so good. Well, it's just fantastic to see a name of a, a shop like that. <laughs> yeah. You'd want a good standing within the community, wouldn't yeah. you, to be a pharmacist? Yeah, it's I think sort of that. You, it was a hub of the town, really, and uh, yeah. people used to come here. Everybody's ill. Everybody comes yeah. to the pharmacy. Opening a new shop was a massive investment, and pharmacists needed to be entrepreneurs to survive. Marketing was everything. <laughs> like many of their predecessors, the new Barber and Goodman Pharmacy is having a grand opening. In order to understand how people responded to 19th century remedies, Barbara and Goodman will dispense authentic but safe Victorian medicines to carefully chosen volunteers. The pharmacy's first customer is Sue Dodd, who's worked as a nurse for 35 years. Hello, Mr. Barber. Hello. <clears throat> I have a very bad cough. Is there anything that you can help me? Well, have you tried modern cures for a, a cold? Do you think they work? Some do, although you can't beat uh, natural local honey um, and lemon for sore throats yeah. um, generally, things like that. Well, mm. in Victorian times, what we'd have given you is Dr John Collis Brown's chlorodyne. I've got a chlorodyne in here. It's um, invented when he was an Indian Army doctor for cholera. It didn't treat cholera, but it became a very popular treatment for coughs, colds, chests, and things like this. Yes. It's got in chloroform, it's got uh, oh, opium right. in it, and it's got cannabis in it. Why would they put those things in? <laughs> well, it makes people feel better, as you might imagine. Many pharmacists made up their own versions of chlorodyne, but the high opiate content made these medicines addictive, and death from overdose was a real risk. Collis Brown's mixture is still on sale today, but with a low, non-addictive dose of morphine. Opium suppresses cough, so if people do have uh, troublesome coughs, then it would help bring that down. What we'll do is we'll look out something for you which is a bit safer. And will it have the uh, opium and things like that? In? No, no, we'll find one without those sorts oh, of things. <laughs> Just use the natural herbs yes. we'll use for this one. That sounds wonderful. Before his customer returns for her authentic Victorian cough medicine, Nick will need to find a less risky so recipe. Hand or whole hand and, anal and aniseed here. Oh, OK, great. Try that, see yeah, what that looks no like. No problem. Balsam, whole hand and, and aniseed. That's it. The one. So what have we got in? Paragoric elixir, tincture of Senegal. The chemist's bible was the pharmacopoeia, which listed all the remedies and potions of the day. The one we can't use, definitely, is paragoric. Right. And paragoric is, um, is camphorated opium. It's, it's a form of opium, so again, we've got the morphine in. Yeah. So what I think we need to do is take that balsam of whorehound and aniseed and see whether we can reformulate it using current knowledge and using things which are a bit safer than some of the ingredients. Oh, my goodness, it's gorgeous at this time of year. Isn't it? Nick's chosen remedy, balsam of whorehound, was made up largely of natural herbs and flowers. Cleavers, this is what we're after, yeah? Perfect, exactly. The job of sourcing the essential ingredients falls to Ruth and herbalist Eleanor Gallia. Eleanor is an expert in plant medicine. A Victorian pharmacist would have needed her knowledge of the natural world. So why do we want cleavers in a cough medicine, then? Because they're the most wonderful immune stimulant and they're very cleansing for the body with respiratory catarrh and conditions, the first thing you really need to do is encourage the phlegm away from the chest. So the body is very good at, at, at cleansing itself and draining itself. A pharmacy needed to maintain a healthy stock of medicinal plants. So do we need anything else as well as the cleavers while we're out? Plantain. Plantain. Oh, that's really quite a common thing. 
The surrounding countryside was a valuable and free resource. They like to be stood on, <laughs> planted into the ground. While Ruth is gathering the ingredients for the cough medicine, at the back of the shop, Nick and Tom open up the pharmacy's laboratory. Wow, look at this place. This is going to be amazing, isn't it? The nerve centre of their business, this is where the pharmacist would experiment with new cures and manufacture drugs and potions. It's halfway between a, an alchemist's cave and a kitchen and a, a storeroom and all sorts, really. Yeah, I mean, in, this is a really interesting space for me. This is a place where they probably changed the most dramatically over the time period we're looking at. Say, 1840s, 50s, this is kind of like a kitchen, right? I mean, you look, you've got the kind of all these ingredients over here, these yes. sort of herbal things, and you'd be here sort of at the bench making your latest kind of concoction for yep. them to sell, sell in the to shop. sell to the lucky public out there. But by the end of the century, this is kind of a more a place of chemical experimentation, right? And we've even got, got a hammer for pounding the herbs. What I hope to learn is some of the techniques which Victorian pharmacists used to use, the manual skills which some of us have forgotten. I also hope to learn some of the different sorts of approaches which they had to medicine in those days. The Industrial Revolution was at its height, and half the population of Britain lived in towns. Overcrowding, poor sanitation and grinding poverty left many people vulnerable to disease. Hundreds of thousands died in the crowded, sewage-ridden cities. But Victorians had only the haziest of ideas about what caused illness or how to treat it. And so they often fell back on traditional remedies. As Nick is about to discover, as he prepares a bruise medicine made from earthworms. Well, I didn't think I'd be doing this when I was doing a Victorian remedy digging, rather bizarrely, for earthworms. Uh, earthworms were part of a, an old remedy which was around before Victorian times, medieval times, really, in which people would take the earthworm and they'd boil up earthworms with uh, olive oil and some form of wine into oil of earthworms, which they put on bruises. Here's one. I want to add to my haul. There must be easier ways to treat bruises than this. Customers would often ask a pharmacist to make up favourite traditional remedies like this. You can always say if people believe in things, then things do work. It's the power of belief on health is, uh, is very great. Oil of earthworm. Who'd have thought that that was a Victorian recipe? It's obviously something that has come from long before, an old idea, one of those things that has hung on into the early part of the Victorian medical experience. In the proper recipe, we use real earthworms and boil them in oil, but in the interest of worm welfare, we're not going to do that. We're going to use these dried worms, exactly the same species, but which we've uh, obtained in pharmacy at this time, you took things which were whole and you had to break them up by physical force. Oh, it's been quite fond of earthworms. Charles Darwin spent a lot of his life studying them. I think he'd be upset by this. I don't think the worms would have been any use at all in a bruise. I think probably it was just came from the old days when people saw things that looks similar and related to them. So, for example, the, the skin of an earthworm, an earthworm, when you take it out of the soil, does look a bit like a bruise. They didn't understand what a bruise was, as we do now, of course. In those days, there wasn't much science around. So if things looked similar, that was probably good enough for most people. We can add some red wine. Seems rather a waste, but... <laughs> Ready to heat up. We've got the stove lit over here. We'll put it on there. I'll bring them over here to cool and take these lucky ones back to the garden. There's a strong placebo effect with, with all sorts of treatments. You know, even modern days, we can get 20 to 30% effect size 
from a, a placebo treatment. And we know that if the doctor's very positive about it and says this will work, it's more effective than not. That's a nasty bruise. How did you get that? Playing around with a tennis ball. Oh. James Scott is a pharmacy student. It's been common throughout history and there's been lots of remedies for it. Uh, we're going to try the uh, oil of earthworm. How literally actual earthworm? Uh, literally it? earthworm. Right, Mixed with olive oil <laughs> and some red wine. We're just going to put that on the, the top. Now, we're going to leave that, uh, and I think tomorrow you should try applying again, and probably morning and evening, and then we'll see how you do in a few days' time. Come okay. back then. OK. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Pharmacist's apprentice, Tom, is hard at work setting up the carboys. So that's the iron... Iron oxide, I believe. I'm going to try and make a, a lovely purple colour so that we can... Um, the idea would be to attract as many people in by sort of demonstrating your pharmaceutical skill in some way, basically. I think we'll just see what happens for the moment. At a time when many customers couldn't read, these tall, colourful storage bottles were a clear sign that this was a chemist's shop. Right, so very red. This is a washing soda. Mix them together. I mean, the, the mixture's slightly purple. Let's have to see what happens. Learning how to mix the chemicals precisely enough to produce a successful colour was a fundamental test of a young apprentice's skill. Half purple, half red there. I don't want to mess up this. How can you trust a chemist who can't even uh, make the colours that are enable you to recognise them as a, as a druggist, you know. I don't know what to do here. Yeah, so it's not really... It's not working that well, is it? Ah! Lovely. Am I looking at the right thing? Yeah, Plantago lanceolata. That's the lanceolate plantain. Ruth and Eleanor have found another wild plant, the common plantain, for Nick's cough cure. Ribs. So what's good about this for a cough medicine, then, plantain? It's used in all sorts of allergies and irritations in the lungs. Once the, ling once the lungs are irritated, then they become inflamed, and then they produce more mucus. So actually what plantain does is it soothes the, it, and tones the mucous membrane. The mucosa is incredibly important because it's where the oxygen that you breathe in dissolves from a gaseous form into a liquid form. And you can actually take it in a tea, you can use it in hay fever, to, when you have that problem, the allergy problem. So it's a very useful plant to befriend. So what about the more exotic ingredients, those things from foreign parts? You'd buy those in from maybe down from, from London. Um, yeah. So, so you, I suppose they're being gathered by herbalists in other parts of the world, really, aren't they, for sale? Herbalists and, and collectors. And they still are. Yeah. They, they still are. It's really interesting, isn't it, how at the beginning of the 19th century there's this sort of body of herbal knowledge. I mean, people like um, Boot, John Boot, you know... And his son, Jesse. And his son, John. Jesse, exactly. You know, the Boots, the chemists, mm. the founders, they begin as a medical herbalist, mm. a little medical herbalist shop selling botanicals in one form or another, inspired by all sorts of different people. Because Jesse himself, Jesse Boot, John's son, was very interesting. He studied pharmacy in his spare time, and then they employed a chemist. And the herbalist business was no longer making money moving no. into... And the druggists were so big at the time and they were very much about making money. And so it was in their interest not to be... Encouraging too much. Well, not, not to be encouraging people to be using their own medicines and growing them. The word drug derives from the Dutch droog for dried plant. Today, there are more than 7,000 medical compounds derived from plants. Tom is edging closer to a near-perfect colour. It looks an all right colour now. All we need to do, really, is dilute it so hopefully a little bit of light goes, comes through it. It's very thick, so I'm just going to go for it and pour this straight in, try not to make too much of a mess, and see what happens. Having achieved a reasonable purple, Tom moves on to the yellow carboy. One explanation for the fixed colours of the carboys reveals an ancient theory that still influenced early Victorian medicine. Yeah, that's about right, I think. 
that each of the colours represented one of the four elements. Job done. Or humours that made up the body. The four humours were black bile, blood, uh, phlegm and yellow bile. And those really equated to things which could be seen coming out of the body, to put it basically. And this is how they understood the body. The body had too much of things inside it and therefore things would come out when it had too much of that humour so it could be kept in balance. Belief in the four humours persisted well into the 19th century. And an excess of blood in particular was thought to be the cause of many illnesses. Bloodletting was big business, and a jar of healthy, voracious leeches was a real money spinner for the Victorian pharmacist. Horrible looking things, aren't they? I think. Carl Peters Bond runs a leech farm in South Wales. What did they use them for in Victorian times? Uh, basically, where they used to cut people to remove blood, which is yeah. obviously very painful, right. uh, the leech can, can bite. It sort of uh, cuts a little Y-shaped hole. Oh, right. So probably a leech this size would probably take about eight mils and you'd probably lose about 50 afterwards. Right, right. It's almost a luxury because it's painless. Yes. Well, fairly painless then. And were they luxury items or were they everyday items? Yeah, they were probably been a very expensive item, so, uh, the, you know, I would consider them a luxury. Yeah. Go on then, let's see what they're, they're like. Well, feels a bit like a slug. Yeah. Feels very leechish. So these would be picked out and they'd be put onto a, onto a patient. Whoop. Not too keen on getting stabbed by that end, <laughs> I must admit. I'm a bit nervous about it, I have to say. Carl's partner, Christopher Peters-Bond, has bravely volunteered to befriend the leech. Quite a bit smaller than the other leeches. They these, these have uh, basically been starved for almost two years, so their, their gut is completely empty of blood. Just lay them on the skin. Yep. Oh, it's really arched its head, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. It's very different to when they're just it? holding on their skin. Yeah. Just tasting it out. Yeah, here he goes. He's sort of having a bit of a nibble. I can feel a, a little, it's like a, like a little bee sting. It's a, uh -huh. it's, it's a, it's, yes. It's a, but apart from that, no, it, it, it's, it's next to nothing at all. It's a, That's what they evolved over millions of years to do. So they bite painlessly and remove the blood. So it's a, a natural pharmaceutical tool, really. And this is a really medieval site, isn't it? About 2,000 years of history here. <laughs> This great, long Western European tradition in bloodletting. But, it, I mean, that's, that's very human of us, isn't it? That the hanging on to tradition, you know, my mother did it, my grandmother did it, my great-grandmother did it, of course it's good for you. Yeah. <laughs> Here's one of its sisters that have... Uh... <laughs> what a Please. contrast. <laughs> <laughs> one hungry leech, one leech three-quarters of the way through his dinner. <laughs> it's like me and my pudding stomach. However full my dinner stomach is, there's always room for pudding. The leech injects an anticoagulant when it bites, and the wound can bleed for up to 10 hours after the leech has dropped off. Even modern first aid can do very little to stop the bleeding. It'll just keep on going, but it's, yeah, it's, it's about 50 mil or so. It shows how potent the chemicals are in its saliva to really produce that effect for such a long period of time. How do you feel after it? I feel fine, to be honest with you. I, I don't really feel any different before. Pleasant experience, you think? Um, it's certainly not as unpleasant as it looks, perhaps. It's uh... yeah. <laughs> all a bit more straightforward. Well, than... Yes. I'm surprised that uh, yeah, certainly there's uh, no pain at all or anything like that. So uh, I completely can uh, understand how someone might sit through several of these thinking that they're doing themselves some good. Yeah. I mean, it certainly beats all the other bloodletting methods, doesn't it? It's so much better than being cut with knives oh, or, I certainly you wouldn't... Know... <laughs> I don't think I would have volunteered for, <laughs> for having a knife cut at me. I hope you still feel as positive about it in ten hours' time when you've changed <laughs> the bandages six times. <laughs> After use, the leech goes back in the jar and the bloody bandages are dried out, ready to use again. It wasn't until the mid-19th century that Victorians understood the dangers of cross-infection, so disease spread easily. All right, next job. But while leeches remained popular, the ever-inventive Victorians came up with man-made alternatives for drawing blood, including the scarifier. They press this button here and the blades would shoot across. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
would be horrible. And then I suppose once you've got it in, you know, you've got to sort of like draw the blood out, haven't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. It would just clot otherwise quite quickly. So if you want to be losing blood, which is the idea, then you need something to draw it out. It. And they've got this beautiful bit of uh, really Victorian kit here, which is the a vacuum pump. It's like a bicycle pump in reverse. They knew how to make equipment, didn't they, in those Just days? So Beautifully Victorian engineered and turned. Once a cut had been made in the skin, the vacuum inside the glass cup drew the blood out. The air out, and then straight on. Straight on. That's it. Oh, I can see it. Oh, there they are. Wow, look at that. That's rising. Yeah. Good you can grief. see there's a bit of redness to it as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. It's bringing the blood to the, the surface, probably breaking little capillaries under there. The blood would be welling up out of there as, as well, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, if you made all those little cuts, that would be yeah. quite yeah. a different thing. Drawing out evil <laughs> vapours <laughs> that had somehow been clogging things up. I could live with that. I'm not sure I could live with that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All the ingredients for the balsam of whorehound cough medicine have been brought to the lab, where herbalist Eleanor joins Nick. So this is whorehound, is it? Where yeah, does whorehound is... live? Is it a big plant or a little plant? Uh, it's a shrub. It's a kind of bluey green shrub. Ooh, she soaked the herbs in alcohol. Now, in your original recipe, you had syrup of squill. Yes. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with squill. Yes, yes. Can be rather toxic, but very old medicine. We've actually got squill. Mm -hmm. And we've got it in an oxymel, right. which What's is an oxymel? an oxymel is honey and, and vinegar. Right. So a member of the lily family, squill, has been used for centuries to loosen mucus from the lungs. So another tincture that we've got is cleavers. This is a really common herb, as yes. Ruth and I discovered. Plantain. This is an interesting one. Again, a very common herb. And then the final herb we've got is the elecampane. Huge, tall, yellow golden flower, a bit like a sunflower, but with enormous leaves. So that is our preparation, ready mm -hmm. to go. A couple of teaspoons of treacle. Hence a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Absolutely. Slow job of stirring this in. The more patience that you can work with, well, like cooking, mm -hmm. the better. So this is the oxymel of, of squill. You can keep stirring as we put it in. The squill's been going for a long time, hasn't it? I think it was in the Ebers papyrus, which is the, the oldest recorded formulary, if you like, which was 1500 BC in Egyptian times, something like that. And apparently it was considered so effective that it was a, an object of temple worship. Really? Yeah. So that's lovely. That's lovely. Ready to bottle it now? Yes. Early pharmacists put art and skill into the medicines they created. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Thank you very much. But in order to make a profit, it was essential that the customer was satisfied and that word got out to the local community that here was a medicine that could be trusted. It smells fantastic, I have to say. I have a smell. Oh, that's a, it smells quite nice. It's half a teaspoon three times a day in a glass of water. See how it is. It's very, very strong. Mm. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's clearing something. Here's the bottle. We'd like you to give that a try. Come back in a few days and we'll see how you feel. <laughs> I'll let you know. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Victorian cities and other industrial centres were notorious for thick smogs or pea supers. This noxious mix of smoke and sulphur dioxide thrown up by the burning of coal made breathing-related illnesses a scourge of the age. Ruth is preparing another type of cough treatment. Oh, volunteer coming in who says he's willing to try out a plaster or plaster 
This one isn't quite the same as a modern plaster. Um, this is a, a, a medical treatment that's something that you put on the skin to draw things out of the body. So it can be all sorts of things, like you, there are plasters that, that uh, fit on the head to help draw away for working for headaches. And there are plasters that help to sort of, you know, like earache, you could put plasters around the back of the ears and it will help to draw humours out. So all sorts of conditions were believed to be able to be relieved in this way. Um, of all the sort of early Victorian forms of medicine. In some ways, this is one of the least invasive, one of the most gentle um, methods, because you're not breaking the skin or anything, you're just applying it on the surface of the skin. And certainly that warmth and the vapours that rise off it, even if they do nothing else, can be really soothing. Um, I've got to melt this wax down, which is going to take a little while, and then I add the olive oil. Plasters were a common preparation for many conditions throughout the 19th century. These sticky leather strips could be infused with different active ingredients and were used to treat a variety of ailments. And this is the most active of the ingredients. This is an oil of frankincense. Oh, it smells wonderful. Right, I just want a couple of drops of this. Some ailments were treated with more dangerous ingredients the poisonous belladonna plant to relieve muscle spasms, lead for cuts, and opium for local pain relief. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that goes into the warm oil. Boy, can I smell that. Frankincense is one of those, you know, valuable spices. Well, it's not... Is it spice? It's a resin from a tree. But it's one of those really important ones in the history of medicine. It's particularly good at sort of clearing things out from the chest which is why it's the important ingredient for this plaster. Next door in the treatment room, Tom is using a favourite Victorian implement, the bronchial kettle, to try and relieve the symptoms of customer Keith Dodd's dry, wheezy cough. What we've got to try and help you with that today is a thing called a bronchial kettle. Looks very interesting. And the idea of this is going to create lots of steam and so on. And it's got some herbs in there and what we're going to do is get, if you, you want to come round here okay. and I can sit you in this, okay. our little booth that we've uh, made in the back here. With added herbs and Tom's self-made tent, the bronchial kettle is an industrial step up from placing the customer's head under a towel over a bowl of steaming water. We'll try and create a kind of uh, steamy environment. Hopefully what will happen is we'll get a kind of a nice, thick steam coming up, and you mentioned that your cough was dry. It's a very, very dry, roughly yeah. cough, yeah. And so what the idea behind it would have been would have to sort of counteract the dryness of the cough in some way by creating a very wet environment for you. Now, this is a scary bit. Ruth now has to cut out a template for her cough plaster. We'll place the leather on a thick and smooth it before putting on the shape. Now I've got to cut a paper stencil. A decent bit of card. That's sort of the shape I want. Ish. Oh, I like making things. And to make it stay in place, I'm to wet it. And I obviously don't need very much at all. OK. So all I've got to do now is cut around and then I could pack these in boxes. You put a piece of wax-proof paper between each one and you can stack them up in boxes so you could sell a box of cough plasters, a box of headache plasters. Although it's sort of a very old idea and an old technique, the whole way of packaging it and selling it is actually really new. And there we go. That's my first chest plaster. Oh, I do have a bit of a cough, yes. You do? Mm. And what sort of a cough is it? A, a bronchial sort of cough. Um, a bit asthmatic. Do you want to Retired the army medic sure. Anthony Dunford has come in to try the plaster. And what I'm hoping is that as the wax melts, mm -hmm. it will release the active ingredient, which is frankincense. Frankincense. So you're going to get that sort of pungent smell Aroma. rising up, you yes. know, under your sort of nose. You'd be breathing it in. 
and it's uh, pointy end down. So that just goes on the centre there, like that, and we just smooth that. I can feel the warmth of your body is melting that wax. I can, it's more pliable than when I put it on. That seems to be sticking. Oh, it is, isn't it? Hey, the self-adhesive plaster! <laughs> Perhaps I don't need my bandages after all. <laughs> I mean, the Victorians obviously would have worn it as long as possible, two or three days. Yeah. So it's really a matter of how much you can put up with before you need to mm. get it off and well, have a wash. I'll persevere. You getting any benefit from that then? Yes, it's, it's definitely helped. I can actually breathe really deeply now, which is what I couldn't have done, you know, ten minutes ago. So it's... Uh, Great. Really helped. I'm certainly breathing more easy at the moment, so... Yeah. <laughs> well, since you seem to be enjoying it so much, then I'll, uh, I'll leave you there for a while. OK, Tom, See... don't forget me. <laughs> right, OK, see you in a bit. The bronchial kettle was one way of clearing the airways, but another popular method was spitting. If a shop wanted to keep the phlegm off the floor, it was in their interest to provide a spittoon. What we've got here is a spittoon full of phlegm would have been one of the worst duties in the shop to have to empty this thing, basically. Cleaning them out was a serious health hazard, as the spittoon could easily be contaminated with tuberculosis, a common disease in Victorian times. The way we think about medicines today, or, and disease today, I mean, this, this idea of lots of different people spitting into the same bowl seems slightly bizarre, but, I mean, Actually, if you think about, certainly, early 19th century ideas of disease, it's not so weird, because the idea is that, really, disease is like a visible thing. This is before bacteriology, remember, so there's no idea of sort of a hidden substance there that's going to give you a disease. So, although there might be a big sort of... The way we might think of it, there'd be a big kind of... Um, huge amount of tuberculosis and all sorts of things festering in this, this swamp, really. Actually, as far as they're concerned, as long as you get rid of the, the mucus itself, no problem. Few things worried Victorians more than their bowel movements, and the pharmacist was able to offer a very special treatment to keep them regular. Victorians believed there was nothing like a good purge to make them feel better. It was what you needed to do, clear yourself out. This is something called the everlasting pill. It's one of my favourite remedies from the Victorian age. And particularly at this time, people wanted to, to purge the body, and this was one of the ways of doing it. And what they used was a pill, a bit like this, which is made out of something called antimony. Antimony is a really heavy metal. It's quite a toxic metal, which we wouldn't use nowadays, but in those days, they didn't see it as that. They'd take this, it would go into their gut, a little bit of the antimony would be dissolved, they'd have vomiting, they'd have diarrhoea, and the pill would pass through. And it's called the everlasting pill because it's fished out of the faeces at the end, washed up, put on a bottle on the shelf, and any member of the family who wants a good purge takes it the next time they want to take it. And potentially it's passed on through the generations. Some doctors began to question the wisdom of using such dangerous techniques. The search for alternative, less risky treatments was on. Malvern Spa in Worcestershire offered an alternative therapy, the revolutionary new hydrotherapy cure. Hey, John. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. I'm in such trepidation about this. Don't worry, it's only cold water. <laughs> and remember, it's five or six in the morning, oh. and I need your help <laughs> to wet the sheets. OK. Dr John Harkup has brought the water cure to Blist's Hi, Hill. Have you done this yourself? Well, not wrapped in a wet sheet, but I had a cold bath on many <laughs> occasions. By cold, you mean...? Oh, yes. Very cold. <laughs> we did some research work in the 1990s about this. It was amazing. I mean, I had my blood test, uh, blood test before and after a cold bath, and my white cell count went, uh, went up 
dramatically. So this is actually... Simulating the immune system. And it really is. I mean, did they know that in the Victorian no, period? No, I hadn't a clue. So why were they doing it then? What is this supposed to do for me? This is supposed to relax you. To relax? Yes. Well, <laughs> sheets, I don't call that very relaxing. <laughs> well, this is the effect of water, you see. Your heart works more efficiently and harder, yeah. and you get a better circulation in other parts of the body. It was so different from bleeding and purging and these heavy metal poisons. So this is a cure for the same sorts of things that, that all those really invasive techniques were being used for. That's right. Of course, none invasive, really. The Malvern water cure was first offered in 1842 by two local doctors who were appalled by the dangers of the drugs and techniques in common use. You warm it up very quickly, oh. honestly. <laughs> I wish you did hurry up and warm up. You're impatient. You're an impatient oh. patient. <laughs> I hate being cold. You're going to feel better because you've been relaxed and you've been stimulated by the cold water. Strange though it is, I would rather do this than swallow a dose of arsenic, mercury, or Lead. whatever. Lead. Lead, exactly. So you could either go to your physician and have something really poisonous yeah. prescribed. Or you could come to Malvern and, and have uh, the health regime. That's right. One day sort me out? No, 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 no. You came for three weeks at least. All right, so you've got all the accommodation costs. So yeah. It was four guineas a week. And then that's a lot of money. It's £400. There were quite a number of famous names on the, on the patient list. Yes. Charles Darwin came and he ended up by saying he didn't think the water care was quackery. Right. And Florence Nightingale came when she collapsed after working too hard doing the report for the Royal Sanitary Commission. Oh, right. And she wrote seven years afterwards that she owed her life to the water cure really? at Malvern. Yes. So how long do I have to stay like this? Uh, an hour. Right. And Great. Then I'll, and then I'll come and unwrap you. OK. I expect okay. you'll be asleep, actually. OK. Cheerio. Bye. Oh, I don't like having my feet all tied up. I always pull the bedclothes out at the bottom of the bed when I go to bed. The Malvern water cure was far more than just being wrapped in wet sheets. Plenty of hill walking and the drinking of endless glasses of spa water were all part of the regime. Taking the waters was hugely fashionable, and manufacturers began producing drinks that mimicked the taste and fizziness of spring water. These quickly established themselves as popular health drinks. Scientist Mike Bullivant will be running the pharmacy laboratory. His working knowledge of 19th century chemistry will be invaluable. Aerated gassed waters are a really big part of the, of yeah. the sales for, uh, for pharmacists. Make lots of money on it. Oh, yeah. hopefully. Well, the basic <laughs> ingredients are cheap enough, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> so how do we make gaseous water? How do we gaseous make water, it? three ingredients. Yep. First is water, obviously. Good start. We've got citric acid. Right. Which is an ingredient in today's waters. It's, uh, oh, right. uh, it's perfectly harmless. Seconding the third ingredient, sodium bicarbonate, oh, baking oh, soda. Right. Another harmless compound. I can now, see them gassing together there, the gas being produced. Oh, you can see you it gassing there. You get carbon dioxide for me. So there's your aerated water. Now, the acid test is, does it pop when you open it? OK, give us a puck, give it a go. Whoa! Result. <laughs> That's a fairly tight uh, seal on there. Yeah. It's a nice design there. This is a good bottle as well, isn't it? One of the big problems in the early days was that producing this water uh, produced pressure and the bottles weren't strong enough yeah. and the early days the pharmacists used to have thick woolen uh, jumpers on they were told <laughs> to wear them to protect them from the broken glass if the bottle exploded yeah. they tried various other bottles i've got a couple yeah, here which they yeah. tried this was uh, a bottle which they produced because one of the problems was if you produced a normal bottle put a cork in it as you did as the cork dried out it shrank pops out yeah. Um, and therefore, they produce this bottle which has a round base, so it can't stand and let the cork dry out. It's put down, it rests on its side, so the corks get permanently wet. Right, here we are, shallow bath. 
and uh, this will prepare you for going up the hills. It's to tone you up. Tone you up. Oh! Blow <laughs> me! Oh! Now, there is other things we can do with the water. <laughs> we can put, give you a douche. You stood naked underneath one of three pipes. One and a half, two and a half, or three and a half inches in diameter. The water from the springs on the hills was in a cistern. Yeah. And it dropped 20 feet onto your naked body. <laughs> and you get 56 imperial gallons of cold water <laughs> going on you. <laughs> you doctor. Yeah. I think I'd better go and get some more water. <laughs> The popularity of aerated or soda waters spread across the empire. In India, British army officers discovered that mixing soda water and the drug quinine was the perfect tonic for victims of malaria. Simply named Indian tonic water, it became not only the world's most celebrated medicinal drink, but also the perfect mixer for gin. Tom's going to learn how to extract the vital ingredient quinine from the bark of the South American cinchona tree. So what is this bark then? Oh, this is the bark from a tree. Yeah, which what? From Peru. It was Peruvian bark, it's from a cinchona tree. Then we got the quinine out that way mm. by chewing it. Or you can make tea with it, you can boil it up with water. It controls fever mm. and it stops you sh shivering. That's one of the, uh, the, 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 things that the, the reasons they used to take it which is quite separate from its anti-malarial properties. It's in killing mm. the anti-malarial parasite. I'm going to take the stuff that you've ground already. This is the ground bark and mix it up with this very strong alkalized calcium hydroxide. Right. And it releases the quinine. This is the process that we're getting that one element out of all of these yeah. then. We're going to isolate one. It's like a needle in a haystack, I guess. <laughs> you know? We will be able to isolate quinine and none of the others. Let's add the chloroform. The solvent chloroform was also popular as a Victorian anaesthetic. Queen Victoria was administered the drug for the birth of two of her children. The quinine will be dissolved in the chloroform. I'm going to really squeeze this extraction procedure. The next stage is to add sulfuric acid to separate the quinine from the chloroform. Return that chloroform. Oh, this one, the custard layer, then, right? The quinine is in this top layer. The custard layer, I like that. I mean, this would be very high, highly skilled work for an apprentice as well. This would be kind of almost, if you were go going into a laboratory and doing something like this, would be really kind of top of your game sort of stuff. Tom's chemistry lesson is about to get even tougher. Tell me if you want a break. I'm all right so far. As Mike adds ammonia to the solution, releasing a pungent odour. I'd do it outside, but I think that one of the reasons for showing you this is to show you what a profession you've joined. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. That's a turning point. Now, that means that all of the sulphate converted. Right, let's leave that to heat up a little bit and see what happens. Yeah, let's go and get some fresh air and a cup of tea. Okay, great. I'll see if Nick wants to come and have a look. Good idea. Hi, Mike. How's the quinine extraction going? You've arrived at just the right moment, mate. The, the quinine is in here. See? But we've also got a load of rubbish in there, a load of impurity that we don't want, so I'm filtering that off. Uh -huh. Quinine should crystallise out. That's, uh, that's if the process has worked. Yep. This is just such a tremendous story of the, the Victorian times, wasn't it? And it's a sort of how, how things changed in terms of, well, the extraction in particular. Yeah. Because quinine was, was valued so much, wasn't it? There were wars fought over quinine and... Well, there are certain people thing. who would say that enabled Europeans to colonise Africa, yeah. the dark continent. Yeah. Because people were going over there exploring Africa, getting malaria and not coming back. Yes. But quinine, right. because of its anti-malarial properties, yeah. would actually allow people to come back. Well, you can see yes. it crystallising as it's falling out. Yeah. Adding the crystallised quinine to the pre-prepared soda water produces the classic Indian tonic water. Let's pick up one crystal. Eh? It's probably way over the legal limit. <laughs> I don't think there was a legal limit in those days. I think it was a damn sight safer than anything else they were doing. 
Yeah. Where you are, Professor Barber? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Let's go find some gin. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Tonic water wasn't the only recipe to be brought home from the British Empire. As pharmacists established themselves, customers came to them to make up all kinds of preparations. Not only medicines, but anything that required precision, including exotic food recipes. This needs to be very, very, very much more precise than I'm used to. I grab myself a bowl. Ruth is attempting to recreate a recipe made famous in 1838 by two Worcestershire chemists, John Lee and William Perrins. So I tend to be quite a touchy-feely cook, you know. This precision, this being able to produce something exactly the same, time after time, is what brought in the money. Worcestershire sauce began life as a recipe for curry powder, brought back from India and given to local pharmacists Lee and Perrins to make up. Oh, I've gone over. How annoying. An employee then suggested that it might work better as a sauce. You see, if I was just cooking, that would have done. It would have been fine. And we've got ginger, obviously, and allspice, pepper, coriander, ground coriander seed, mace, brandy, and asafoetida. An interesting substance. It was used as an aid to digestion for centuries in Persia, which is where it's from. It helps to, um, well, it stops flatulence, basically. This, like many of these ingredients, actually were felt to have medicinal properties, of course, as well as being nice tastes. And that could be some of the reason why they're in here. I mean, the asafoetida, you know, this is a sauce, a relish to eat with food, so the fact that it might help to calm your digestion would be really useful, would be a benefit, a bonus. Now. Yeah. The vinegar. But Lee and Perrins found the resulting mixture so distasteful that they abandoned it in the shop's cellar. Years later, while clearing out the cellar, they discovered the sauce had fermented into something far more acceptable, and the new product was born. See, my instinct is just to guess. <laughs> right, that's all of those in there. A nice spicy, spicy mix. If a recipe proved particularly appealing, there was nothing to stop pharmacists from selling their own preparation en masse. Some of today's biggest brand names started from such humble origins. Mr Lee and Mr Perrins thought it tasted utterly disgusting at this stage, so... Oh, pink and egg, that's powerful. It's strong. It's quite nice. <laughs> Maybe I've got a stronger palate than Mr Lee and Mr Perrins. Yeah. And that looks quite good. All I've got to do is come up with a name. In the 1840s, getting the name right, getting the brand right, was really important if you wanted to sell loads. Barbara and Goodman's Spectacular Shropshire Sauce. Ruth's Spectacular Shropshire Sauce joins the pharmacy's new range of branded products. The end of the process, isn't it? Yeah! I'm just getting an insight into all the, the different processes that get, went into making this tonic water, you know. I know, it is different, isn't it? The whole business of making stuff and then selling it, it's quite... You can see how people would have felt really proud of what they've achieved as well, yeah. you know, in terms of seeing it through from the very inception. There we go. There's a sense in which the chemist and druggist is becoming a, a much more powerful force in some way. Through, on the one hand, you know, being hard-headed businessmen and making, a, making their shops into profitable going concerns, if you like, and on the other hand saying, we're going to introduce chemical knowledge into the pharmacy. To celebrate their first week in business, Barbara and Goodman are holding an open evening, a chance to offer some of their new products to the public and to catch up on how their customers are doing. You only need a tiny bit, it's a strong. You know, you want a couple of drops on your chips sort of sauce, those sorts of flavours. 
It's that scrunched. It's, 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 it is. <laughs> There's something about it that just gets me. <laughs> I've really enjoyed this first experience of early Victorian medicine. It's been such a combination of so many things from the past and new experiments into the future. We've been launching off now into the new science and if anything, this experience has really sort of whetted my appetite for the next finding out, the next where did it go from here. Oh, there we go. Once well, the actual steam kettle got going and uh, the actual herbs came through, there was that ten minute spell when the, the smell of rosemary and thing came in. Mm. And it was, that was beautiful, that was. Once it got going, it was really exciting for me. I'm, I'm still, still <laughs> got the bruise, I'm Still got the bruise. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a look then, let's see how it went. Gone, well, shade, gone shades of yellow yeah, in the middle. Yeah, it's changing like, like yeah. they do. I would say those remedies have had no effect whatsoever. Uh, at uh, what do you think? I'll be tempted to agree. Yeah. And they, they, well, they've been as a nuisance, to be honest. The main issue is actually going to bed knowing that I've got worm on my arm <laughs> and then lying there and actually not wanting to get the duvet on the worm <laughs> with that knowledge in mind. So it, it's, also, it's, it's greasy and it kind of... Yeah. I'm, I'm constantly kind of aware that I'm just getting it on my clothes. It doesn't really soak in, so... Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't see the appeal, to be honest, to actually use it. It's not looking like a good remedy to sell in modern day times. I can't, uh, I can't see it making, <laughs> making it on the market today. <laughs> I found this, seeing how the Victorians approach pharmacy, fascinating. There's a, a spirit and adventure and entrepreneurism there. We're understanding the nature of the interaction between the medicine and the patients themselves. Very, very nice. Mm. Um, in fact, you know, I would swish it round a bit before I swallowed it. That's lovely. With the time, you can really use it as a gargle. Yes. And it helped um, get rid of the um, soreness that I did have in the throat. I can actually say, yes, it has helped a lot. And has it eased your breathing? It's much better. Before, uh, as I breathed out, it was very crackly, it was very difficult. A typical asthmatic type um, feeling, and it has helped. I can feel as though I breathe normally again for the first time in more than three weeks. Oh, lovely! Which and is super. I'm dying to ask, how long did that plaster last? About three hours. About three hours? Mm. Well, that's more than I thought, actually. Mm. What was it like? Well. I've never had chamois leather next to my skin, but it is quite comfortable. But I didn't um, get any feeling of the frankincense. Right. There didn't seem to be any essence coming out of it at all. Uh, uh, and what, I mean, when it fell off, it just sort of straight well, to the just, floor? it just literally just peeled off and just dropped at my feet. <laughs> and so, let's have a toast. Cheers. All right. Or perhaps we should say good health. Yeah, good health. <laughs> good health. <laughs> May you all come back as customers, often! <laughs> By the end of the 1840s, scientific advances were beginning to filter down to the high street pharmacist. Old ideas of bloodletting and purging gave way to exciting new techniques and cures. And pharmacists would spearhead a whole new range of consumer experiences. Nipple shields. Blood and stomach pills as well. Next time on Victorian Pharmacy, the medicine that was supposed to cure everything. Soap powder acts as a laxative. Yeah, I'm willing to try everything. <laughs> the discovery of how to kill germs. Look at that. Look at that girl. Give me a shout if it gets too much right. or anything, all right? Yep. And more Victorian contraptions are unleashed on the public. Look at that. She's almost doing that by herself. <laughs>